Watching Gears, brought to you by Holly Performance Products. Fuel your passion. And Cornwell Tools, the choice of professionals. If you turn on the TV on any given day and start channel surfing, there's a good chance you're going to run across an automotive auction, and you're going to notice a couple of things. Not only are the cars really cool, but some of the prices they're bringing are shocking. And they can have a tremendous impact on the collector car industry. So what is the deal with these auctions? Are they legit? Are they truly representative of what's going on in the classic car world? And if they are, how do you, the average car nut, get involved in that? How do you approach it as a collector? How do you approach it as an enthusiast? And how do you not get burned in the process? Well, that's the trick. But it is possible to actually get a good deal at an auction and maybe even put some money in your pocket. And that's what we're going to show you as we follow an enthusiast and a collector into the crazy world of the auto auction. Jeff Brower has been an automobile nut his whole life. And over the years, as time and money have allowed, he has amassed a fairly large auto collection. What you see in here uh, started out as one car. As opportunity arose, I ended up collecting more cars and getting cars. Yeah. And all of them run, all of them drive. They all have oil dripping underneath them. Yeah. And I always say, if they ain't dripping, they ain't running. No stranger to the auction world, Jeff is a regular at the Meekum Auctions, and his garage has a lot of the classic collector vehicles that you would expect to see, like early Corvettes and Tri-5 Chevys. But as cool as these are, these cars are not as popular as they once were, and the auction value reflects that. And this is something that Jeff constantly keeps an eye on. If you've got a car you want to sell or you want to buy a car, even if you don't buy it at auction, learn from watching those auctions what the values really are. But some of the hottest cars on the market are the 60s Mopars. And obviously Jeff is a big fan of those as well. And like most collectors, there's always one or two really special cars that the owner hopes will be a high dollar investment. In Jeff's case, it's an all original, unrestored 1970 Hemi Cuda with only 16,000 original miles on the clock. This is the one he hopes will bring some serious money. Found that car back in a, uh, at an auction, hidden away in the dark. Mm -hmm. Looked close and it's really not just a Shaker Cuda, it's a Hemi Cuda. And an interesting thing, when I bought that, it really wasn't already gone through and certified everything. So I had that done and when we were going through that, we actually found the build sheet for the car. Wow. Under inside of the back seat, which is where they were. Yeah. But nobody ever took the seat off to look. It was still in there. Now, I know you're probably thinking, man, those are some great cars. Why in the world would you sell those? Well, it is possible to have too much of a good thing. And that's where the auction world comes in. But there's a lot of things to consider here. It grew and grew and grew until the point I'm at right now where I don't have anybody to take care of them, I take care of them. Yeah. And chargers on every car, keeping gas fresh, yeah. you know, taking care of them and maintaining them became a problem. Finally just woke up about a year ago and said, you know what, it's time to thin the herd, cut it down, and then get back to a few cars that I'm really going to drive and have fun with. Brian Silvati, on the other hand, is not a collector. Matter of fact, he only has one car a 1970 Plum Crazy Purple Dodge Challenger, and he has owned it for 30 years. Yeah, 30 years. So it obviously has incredible sentimental value to him. I've got a daughter, and she, uh, she grew up around the car. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was there when she was born, and then she got to drive it when she was 16. And I really thought back about it, and I said, well, you know, I've developed all these great memories, and that you can't take away. There's a point where you decide, what am I going to do next? And what better way to sell your car for 30 years than with your friends at an auction? There's no doubt that the hardest part of buying or selling at an auction is not becoming so personally involved with the vehicle that you buy too high or sell too low. For example, if you ever saw the movie Tulane Blacktop, you want this car. You need this car. You can see yourself driving this car. But your pocketbook and your common sense might be telling you to run away. 
there's a thrill, there's a challenge. It's almost like there's a little bit of a competition in there. And time seems to change. It seems to you go into sort of a time warp. Doesn't happen for the vehicle before the one you're selling or buying or the one afterwards. But when you're in that hot seat, there's an excitement there. Yeah. And I think that's why so many people really like to come out to Meekum Auction and participate in the live experience. It's yeah. a thrill. It takes a lot of self-control to be a buyer because it's very easy to get wrapped up in an auction. Very easy to get wrapped up in the bidding process and before you know it, it's like gambling, right? I'm gonna go spend $100 and end up spending $300 because you don't have the self-control. You have to have the self-control to say, no, that's it. Just like Jeff, Brian has decided to sell his car with no reserve. This is kind of a risky move because that means that there is no safety net if the bids are low. The car's gonna sell to the top bid no matter what. I went along with the idea of no reserve because I agree the fact is if you're gonna get up there and transport the car and go through all this preparation to put it in the auction, you're probably not gonna wanna bring it back. And uh, it's gonna bring what it brings. I mean, I hope it does well, and if it, you know, whatever it does, I'll be happy. <laughs>
I was really thinking it'd be two to two fifty. It didn't do it. The announcers actually said somebody got a heck of a deal that day, and they did. But more power to them, you know. If I'd have been only selling that one car, I'd have been broken. When somebody's considering bringing a car to an auction, that they need to understand that our programs and our procedures and our policies are really geared towards a first-time seller, as well as an experienced consigner. Keep in mind, you're going to bring it to a Mecham auction, and in 90 seconds, give or take a few either way, there's going to be a decision on whether that car's going to sell or not. Brian, on the other hand, had a stomach ache all day long as his prized purple Challenger inched closer to the auction block. However, once it hit and the bidding started, Brian's nerves turned into excitement as the numbers came up into the range that he'd hoped to get. Here comes my car, somebody else is driving it, and it gets pulled in that line and I'm going like, you know, uh, this, is, this is probably no turning back now, you know, I've, it's beyond my control. It jumped up pretty quickly, got to, uh, you know, got to 45, which was in range. It's, once it did that, I was okay, all right, we're good. And then it was relief. Man, when that was over, it was the biggest relief ever. And then I could enjoy the experience more. And Parnelli's big ole Bronco? Well, it did pretty well too, pulling down $1.7 million. And honestly, the guy that got that got a heck of a deal based on the amazing racing pedigree that Big Ole has. Million seven hundred thousand dollars. But Parnelli and Brian weren't the only ones smiling that day. Jeff also did really well on his collection, despite the disappointment with the Cuda. 70 GTX, not numbers matching in any way. Original color, sublime, great color, looks wonderful. Went for 70, 75 grand. I never dreamed I'd get that. I was thinking, feel 45, 50 grand. Yeah. But that day, there was the people in the room or on the line or on the phone that were wanting that car. And I just kept watching it rise, rise, rise. And it was like, yeah. I, I'm absolutely amazed. So much energy, Adam. If you've never gambled and go into a casino, it's really easy to lose your next month's paycheck. If you go to an auction and you've never been to one, you're overwhelmed with the atmosphere at a big auction. And, and the hype and all the cars and every car you've ever dreamed to have it is probably there in some shape or form. And it's, it's very easy to fall in love and get too deep. Not more than half of the fun is looking for it and finding the car. Yeah. Once you get it and it's here, then you still want that rush of going and finding another car. It was a interesting mix of excitement and dread <laughs> all at the same time. Uh, be realistic about what your car value is. Because if you go in there, especially the first time, thinking, and everybody does, it's your baby, right? It's worth this. It's worth that to you. But you really need to know where it is in the market. Otherwise, the disappointment would be difficult to, to try and sell a car for more than what it really is worth. So there you have it, an inside look at the auction process through the eyes of two guys that actually lived it. And as you can see, it is possible to get a good deal at an auction. It's also possible to lose your shirt. So you need to be careful and you need to pay attention to the market. But one thing is for sure, an auction is the ultimate car show because you're going to see all kinds of vehicles and they're all for sale to possibly you, if you're the highest bidder. And now, Seal Tech, brought to you by Steel Rubber Products, helping restore the car of your dreams. For today's Seal Tech, we're going to continue with our list of the seven biggest mistakes that you can make when you're dealing with weather stripping. Why? Because weather stripping is on pretty much everything. And the more tips and tricks that you know, the easier it is. Now, so far, we've dealt with number one throwing away your original weather stripping before you have a replacement. Number two, not prepping the surface properly. And now we're moving on to number three, not test fitting the new weather stripping before you try to install it. Now, there are several reasons for doing this. Number one, you want to make sure that the piece of rubber in your hands is the right part. And you're not trying to install the rear window weather stripping onto the front window because these things can tend to look the same. 
Also, a lot of weather stripping has corners built into it. They've got clips. They've got all kinds of plugs. Some are held in with screws. And a test fit will reveal if you need to pick up any extra fasteners to put the weather stripping in. And then finally, on a lot of door and window weather stripping, sometimes you've got to cut it and trim it to get it to fit just right. Now is the time to do it. This is why a test fit of new weather stripping is important. Mistake number four goes right hand in hand with the test fit, and that is not double checking the orientation of the rubber as you're installing it. Now, I know you're probably thinking, what? How hard can it be? You just put it in. Oh, take a look at this. There's a lot of grooves and nooks and crannies and weird shapes on these weather stripping pieces. And it is really easy to get things turned around. You would be surprised how many people will install a piece of weather stripping upside down or backwards, especially in a trunk. Another tip to help keep things orientated properly is to take pictures of a piece of the original rubber in place on the vehicle or save a small piece of the original rubber with it well marked on how it fits. And now, Parts Bin. If you've been following the magazine world lately, you know that most of the traditional car mags disappeared a couple years ago. But in their place has risen a super high quality coffee table level magazine called Wheel Hub. There's only one problem. There are just too many cool vehicles out there to fit them all into Wheel Hub. So they have come out with some additional titles like Truck Hub, Mustang Hub, and Chevy Hub. Now these all feature the same high quality photography and writing the Wheel Hub has, but they focus on different types of vehicles and genres to add even more variety to your car vocabulary and your knowledge. If you think Wheel Hub is good, you need to check out these new titles to see what other kinds of cool vehicles you might be missing out on. You know, one of the best ways to get more power out of your engine is to get more air into it. And obviously a supercharger is one way to do that. But one of the best ways for you Mopar guys to do it on that Hemi is to put on one of these Intec cold air intakes from Holly. Now check this out. It comes with a high flow filter. Then you have a one piece air box. So you get a nice cold blast of air. You have a one piece intake tube. So you get even better flow and it's all designed to bolt right in the stock location. The best part is when Holly put this on a stock car, they picked up 16 horsepower on the dyno. Yeah, pretty impressive for a bolt on air intake system. Now, obviously they have them for Fords and Chevys, but this, this is for you Mopar guys. What are you working on? Brought to you by Woodward Fabrication, selling quality metalworking equipment since 1966. Today's What Are You Working On comes from Valerie. She is in Texas and she has a 1965 Chevy El Camino, which is what they call the family affair. Now, it's not what you're thinking. This is what's going on. She said she saw this car in the neighbor's front yard and thought it would be a great family project for her grandson for his first car. This would give them two years to build the car before he gets his driver's license. So she said her son agreed and bought the car. Now it had been disassembled years ago, but the owner assured them that he had most of the parts. Yeah, you see the key word there, most of the parts. <laughs> yeah, we'll check back with you on that one. Now, so far, the body has been pulled off and the frame has been blasted and painted. The Chevy 350 is back sitting in the motor mounts. The Muncie four-speed is connected, the driveline attached. You didn't tell me this was a four-speed car. That's awesome. Also, she said that her dad bought a dress-up kit for the motor and grandpa showed Brandon how to pull the balancer and install the new timing cover. So this truly is a full family affair. Now they said they have a big shopping list, but they're slowly getting the car together. And she said that 
We're keeping all the receipts in a binder. Grandpa's and Grandma is photographing every step of the build. And Brandon asks every day if they've gotten new El Camino parts. That's a smart kid. Listen, Brandon, anytime you can get mom and dad and grandpa and grandma to buy the parts, you're a smart kid, man. <laughs> You'll go a long ways, especially in your El Camino. Oh, seriously, folks, what a great project. What an inspiring thing for a family to get out and do something together. So to recognize such a cool project, we hooked up with our buddies at Woodward Fab. We're gonna give you one of these tubing notchers because you never know when you're gonna need one of those. And then we're gonna give you a project planning book. You have got to have this. Get rid of that binder. Keep all the important stuff about that build in this book. This will save your life down the road as you try to remember what you did to that car. Also, we're going to give you one of our V8 Interceptor t-shirts and we're going to give you a gift card from Holly to help offset some of the cost. And then finally, we're going to give you a Sergeant Rock die cast. Now, for the rest of you guys, if you want to get in on this, get your project featured on the show, man, you got to send it to us. Go to our website, go to Gears Nation, and submit it into What Are You Working On? The website's also the place to find out more information on any products you may have seen on the show, any Gears merchandise, and how to join Gears Nation. Now, being a Gears Nation member gives you access to our new app through Android and iOS, where you can watch all of our Gears content commercial-free. Also, don't forget to check us out on Amazon Prime for Gears and the Restoration Series. Finally, don't forget to like us on Facebook and Instagram so you can get some behind-the-scenes footage on our weekly web series, Shifting Gears. And if you're a radio person, make sure you check out our new podcast, Tales of a Gearhead. All right, that wraps it up for us today. Hopefully this inspires you to get out and work on something, maybe even get your family involved. You never know unless you ask. All right. Get out there, work on something. We'll see you next time.